Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Christina Byrne and I'm the Public Outreach Manager here at OCTA. Um, I wanted to mention a few housekeeping items before we get started and then I will mention them again when we get to the official listening session portion of the meeting. Tonight's presentation is being recorded and it will be available on the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study website in a few days. Tonight includes a brief presentation on the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study efforts thus far. And after the presentation led by Dan Fu, I will facilitate a listening session portion of the evening. We have quite a few attendees this evening and in order for us to hear from as many participants as possible, I respectfully request participants to keep their comments to two minutes or less per person. And please note if others have brought up similar points. We are here to listen this evening. This is one of the first steps in the study process. Please keep in mind, we may not have all the answers to every question this evening, but we are um, capturing all the comments we're receiving as far in writing and verbally, and they will be um, incorporated as a part of the study going forward. Again, my name is Christina Byrne and I'm the Public Outreach Department Manager at OCTA. And we will be having a brief presentation followed by a listening session this evening. Next slide, please. Tonight's meeting is also going to be available in Spanish. Um, to listen to the presentation in Spanish, please click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And everybody participating tonight will need to select a preferred language, language English or Spanish. If you would like to hear the presentation in Spanish only, please click the original audio. Esta reunión está disponible en español y También, le pedimos si quiere escucharla en español, por favor haga clic en el icono de interpretación que está abajo en el, en el screen de Zoom y por favor elija el, el idioma español. Uh, para escuchar solo el idioma en español, por favor haga clic en el texto que dice Mute Audio para escucharlo en, en español solamente. Next slide, please. Our meeting format tonight is in Zoom webinar. And for those of you who haven't um, participated in a meeting in this way, it is common practice to host these uh, large meetings in this format um, to allow for large groups participating and to ensure a more seamless experience for all participants. As Christina mentioned, this meeting is being recorded to actually accurately capture your input and the recording will be available in its entirety on the OCTA website. Um, comments will be addressed after the presentation and during the listening portion of the session. However, we do encourage you to, to submit your comments throughout the presentation. And there's a few ways that you can do this. Um, actually, you can submit a written comment um, using the Q&A function. And the rest of the participants will be able to view your question or comment in real time. We are reserving the chat function for our team to be able to share resources with you and links. Um, please note that both the written and verbal comments are equally considered by our team. There is a closed captioning button as well at the bottom of the screen. If you would like to utilize that function, please select that as well. And as a reminder, you will, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand using the Zoom um, button um, and you can state your name prior to providing your comment. Next slide, please. A few other ways to participate, like I mentioned verbally, you can raise your hand using the raise hand button and um, we will be able to call on you. Um, you can also type in your comment or question using the Q&A function. And if you do so, we are welcome to add your organization name if name and organization. When announced, we will unmute you and you can then ask your question. You will be remuted once you conclude your comment. There are some folks who may be participating via phone and we ask that you press star nine on your keypad to raise your hand and you will be announced by the last four digits of your phone number. Uh, please press star six to unmute your audio and then we will remute you when you complete your answer. Um, and we will repeat these, these uh, instructions of how to participate as soon as we get into that portion of our presentation. Next slide. 
Thank you, Maria. Um, now we'll be going through the brief at agenda. Uh, Dan will be reviewing the history of the corridor, also reviewing the goals and objectives of the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study, short and midterm, as well as potential reinforcement areas. I'll be reviewing the study schedule and key milestones, as well as the study outreach, and then we will, we will transition into listening session of this evening. Next slide, please. Now Dan will begin his presentation. All right. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Maria. And good evening, everyone. I'm Dan Fu. I'm from the Orange County Transportation Authority. I'm here um, in the planning division. So I'll take a moment and kind of give you the context and the background for why we're undertaking this study and what we have reviewed so far. And then we'll uh, get into the listening session. So just to kind of put it in context, wanted to kind of make sure everybody's aware of OCTA's role and relationship with the railroad. So with respect to the railroad in Orange County, OCTA owns approximately 40 miles of the, um, the railroad corridor within Orange County. And of that 40 miles, seven miles are within a critical coastal area within the cities of Dana Point as well as San Clemente. And then as far as OCTA's role with the railroad, we're also the managing agency for the Low Sand Rail Corridor Agency, which is a joint powers authority for a 351 mile um, railroad that spans from San Diego all the way up to St. Louis, St. Louis Obispo. And then finally, OCTA is also a joint powers uh, authority member of Metrolink or otherwise known as Southern California Regional Rail Authority. And um, in terms of that's the ownership and the relationship with OCTA. But what's unique about this is OCTA is not the railroad operator. The railroad operator of record is actually um, Metrolink, or in the case of in South Orange County, the uh, BNSF Railway. And so that there is a unique relationship in terms of the ownership as well as the um, as well as the railroad operator of record. And then finally, I want to emphasize. Within the seven mile stretch, a good portion of that is actually within um, 200 feet or less from the coastline. Hence, we have seen a lot of the issues that's been occurring over the last several years. And what's also unique is there are challenges with respect to having to deal with the railroad running between, sandwiched between the bluffs and then the bluffs on the inland and then the coast uh, or the ocean on the seaward side. Next slide, please. So with this particular slide, I think what is really telling is this particular railroad line has been in operation since 1888, the late 1800s. And when you look at the first 130 or so years, there's only really been three major closures. So in the early 1930s, late 1930s, and then early 1990s, there's been uh, those have been the closures over the last 130 plus years. What has really been telling is since 2021, which is not even uh, five years, it's really uh, four years at this point, or three years at this point, we've experienced five closures, and as recent as January of this, this year with, um, with the Mariposa Pedestrian Bridge. So next slide, please. So this is just depict, this particular slide depicts the changing conditions over the last 50 years. You can see it's not just the, um, the, the coastline has changed, but you can see development has drastically changed over the last several decades. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a bit of change in the environmental setting. And obviously what's also telling is the beach width, when you look at the upper Right-hand photo, you can see the beach width in 2013. And then when you look at 2017, it started receding and then it just got worse in 2021. Next slide, please. So this is a particular uh, graphic that's research that's been done by Dr. Brett Sanders over at UCI along with his doctoral student, Dan Cole. And this is back in uh, April of this year. So what they had looked at was 20 years of the, the beach in the two cells. Uh, the top portion is the St. Pedro cell, and then the bottom portion is the Oceanside cell, which is germane to our discussion tonight. 
And when you look at really kind of a big picture takeaway from the San Pedro cell, there was a lot of green. And what that basically in essence tell, tells us is the beach has actually um, gained in terms of the width overall. But when you look at the ocean size cell, there's a lot of red, which suggests that there was a net loss in terms of the beach width over the last two decades. Next width, uh, I'm sorry, next slide, please. So this particular slide just su summarizes the four projects that we have undertaken um, as far as the last few years in terms of all the emergency repairs that we've had to undertake. And I wanna emphasize when you uh, think back on a couple of slides, it shows 130 years, three events, last handful of years, five closures. So that tells us even though the railroad has been there for over 100 years, the service really hasn't changed drastically, but yet these emergency events are happening, whether it's landslides or whether it's the, the um, lack of beach. So that is the reason why we're gonna need to undertake and try to get to the root of the issue. And then what's also shown on this slide it, uh, are a couple of studies that are undertaken by the city of San Clemente. And we're uh, actually with this particular study, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we're working with the likes of the city of San Clemente as well as the County of Orange and others, including academia and, and others to make sure that we're up to speed and well-educated on the science of coastal erosion and so forth. Next slide, please. So all of the... I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, so all of what I've shared with you as far as the issues that we've had over the last handful of years has led us to uh, determine there's a need to look at what is the root cause of the problem. Again, I want to emphasize the railroad has been here for over 130 years. There really, in essence, have not been a lot of issues through the um, even 2020s, and then until 2021, there's a whole host of issues. So with respect to that, we're looking, um, we had undertaken, undertaken a short and midterm study. This is looking at protecting the railroad in place while a longer term solution is being looked at. So I'll touch on the green side, which is the right box, which is to look at coastal retreat strategies, whether it makes sense to relocate the railroad inland similar to what our neighbors down in Sandag are uh, looking at and working with the folks and the, and the uh, communities down there. But what I want to emphasize is there is a major difference besides the fact that the environmental setting is different with respect to the railroad down in, uh, in San Diego versus up here, that being they're above the, the bluffs and we're on the bottom. But what is also important to note is Sandag is looking at potentially relocating approximately 1.7 mile of their, um, their railroad from the coast to an inland alignment, whatever that inland alignment may be. In terms of the complexity here, we're looking at seven miles. So it's orders, orders of magnitude more complex. So hence, we need to look at protecting the railroad in the meantime, so that we don't have any more interruptions and unplanned interruptions with all of the uh, uh, situations and, and is issues we've had over the last handful of years. So a study is underway. This particular study started in the latter part of 2023. It is a 24 month study. We're still in the infancy, I emphasize, still in the infancy of the study. And it's really been broken up into kind of three phases. The short term, looking at solutions that would last us, say, upwards to a decade. And then midterm, solutions that would last us up, upwards of several decades. But what is also important is really the here and now. What are things that we can do to secure the railroad so we don't end up with another emergency closure? So that's been um, something we've shared with um, in, in many of these meetings as well as with the public. And we've garnered quite a bit of feedback in terms of some of the solutions that we've looked at. But really, these are 10,000 foot solutions or, uh, or even uh, issues that we're looking at as well as the potential solutions, which I'll get more into. And then I think the, the other key part of this particular study is engaging stakeholders. And then Christina is going to be touching on that. But unlike your traditional study where 
will come up with the solutions and garner the feedback as far as what they are. And at this point, we do not have any solutions as far as the short and midterm because we're engaging the, the public and the stakeholders in these listening sessions. And then we'll go to the drawing board with all of the feedback that we've um, uh, obtained up to this point and start that process. So next slide, please. So I wanna kind of do a deeper dive into the initial assessment. So as I talked about earlier, there's the short and the midterm, 10 years out, 30 years out, solutions that will last us basically kind of those two timeframes. But in light of what's been happening over the last several years with five closures and landslides and all the issues that we've, we've been experiencing over the seven mile stretch, we wanna basically identify areas that are of imminent threat to the railroad's integrity. And so our engineering team had gone out there and looked at the seven mile stretch of the railroad. And really this is just to look at the here and now. This is not the short term, not the midterm solutions. And what, we're, what we've are what done is in essence, looked at protecting the railroad, what I call kind of the here and now while we're looking at other solutions um, that we have talked about. And so this particular effort builds on previous efforts by others, as well as the site reconnaissance field uh, visit and so forth, as well as identifying solutions and strategies really at a 10,000 foot level. They're by no means engineered or even uh, detailed planning. They're really at a 10,000 foot level. And then it's really to look at emergent issues so that we can try to get ahead of another closure that we've been experiencing a number of over the last handful of years. So this particular effort, the outgrowth, resulted in, um, and maybe we'll jump to the next slide, but this will be a good demonstration. It resulted in areas that needed to be monitored. So they identified, the team identified seven areas that are in need of monitoring. Nothing that has to be done at this very moment, but we need to keep an eye on these areas and make sure these particular sites are not getting worse. And if they are, then there may be immediate actions that are taken and obviously we'll need to coordinate with the likes of Coastal Commission as well as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for the regulatory permitting processes and of course working with the, um, the local communities as well as the city of San Clemente and others. So in this particular um, slide it shows the seven areas that need to be monitored and then uh, two of the seven are on the inland side and then five of the seven are on the seaward side. So next slide please. So here are four areas that we have identified, the team has identified that are in need of potential reinforcement. And again, these are very much 10,000 foot level concepts. And what the team has identified are effectively three areas that are on the seaboard side. So areas one, two, and four are on the seaboard side. And area number three is on the inland side. And I'm gonna do a, a, a deeper dive into each one of these. So next slide, please. So for area number one um, and effectively area, area number two, and by the way, there's a map, corresponding map to the right that correspond, uh, corresponds to each one of the, the areas that we're talking about. Um, there is effectively a lack of beach and so the potential, potential solution to protect the integrity of the railroad would be some riprap placement to anchor the toe of the, uh, the slope uh, such that when the waves are hitting it uh, during the next storm event, that it would protect the integrity of the railroad. Uh, next slide, please. A similar situation here for area number two, you can see there's no beach that's on the seaboard side, and um, the, the last line of defense is really just the railroad at this point. Next slide, please. So for area number three, this particular area, and by the way, the exercise that the team had undertaken was between November of last year through early part of January of this year. You can see the Mariposa pedestrian bridge was still in place back when they were, uh, the team was doing the work. And unfortunately, all of that set in motion in late January where there was a landslide and it dislodged a couple of spans of the bridge. And I'm sure many of you have seen the photos of um, the, the bridge spans having been removed. 
And so for, for these particular four areas, I do want to emphasize that these imminent threats are very real. As you can see, area number three was set in motion, unfortunately, uh, before the, the, the this little mini study was even finalized. And then as far as possible solutions, we're looking at potentially a catchment wall. But again, um, there is no engineering or planning that's been done beyond um, you know, what we have at this point. So next slide, please. For area number four, it is slightly different in terms of the solution versus areas number one and two. There is a beach there, but you can see the escarpment with respect to the, the person standing right there. It's about 12 feet tall, roughly, or 10 feet. And you can see that there's no protection for the railroad. So the potential solution that um, that is one concept is an engineer revetment that's, uh, that's being considered. So next slide, please. So with that, I'll hand it over to Christina and, uh, and then she can talk about the outreach effort as well as the uh, general um, process with respect to the stakeholder engagement uh, during this two year process. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. This slide outlines the study milestones. The initial assessment Dan discussed is currently available on our website. If you wish to read the full report, you can certainly find it there. Public outreach is a major part of this two-year study, and we have touch points throughout that I'll outline. The first step in our outreach process is the listening sessions, which um, is what we're doing this evening. Um, those, are, um, can, those are being held from the month of February to May of this year. And then additional opportunities to provide feedback will be available during the initial concept development refinement of the concepts and the draft feasibility report phases. The final report is anticipated in fall of 2025. Next slide, please. The goal of the listening sessions is to hear from the community and document the feedback accordingly. Um, we are sharing the framework of the study as a part of the listening session to protect the existing coastal rail line and minimize passenger and freight service disruptions for up to 30 years. We're also identifying opportunities to further enhance collaboration and all, all feedback we're receiving, whether it's an email to myself or Dan, um, any verbal comments this evening during tonight's listening session or in writing and other listening sessions will all be documented as a part of this effort. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the feedback we have received to date during listen, listening sessions with federal, state, and regional partner agencies, corridor cities, and major employers, as well, well as residential communities. Some reoccurring themes include considering other natural solutions, such as sand and a living shoreline, seeking partnering opportunities with other, other stakeholders, support for early comprehensive preventive action, continuing coordinated streamlined communication when there's service disruptions, concerns regarding impacts to employee commute patterns and regional tourism, and lastly, make sure we're consulting with coastal and marine habitat experts. Next slide, please. Now we will transition to the listening portion of our time together. We have quite a few attendees this evening, and in order to hear from as many participants as possible, I respectfully request participants to keep their comments to two minutes or less per person if they're speaking orally, and I will read comments and questions we're receiving in the Q&A. Also, please note if others have brought up similar points, and we are here to listen. This is one of the first steps in the study process, and we really want to make sure we hear from you. Keep in mind, though, that we may not have all the answers this evening, but we will be addressing as much as we possibly can as the study, progress as the study progresses. A few reminders, um, written comments and questions can be submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and participants will be able to view them in real time. They'll also be, you're also able to view others' comments. Also, there is a um, availability for use, you to use closed captioning. Select CC at the bottom of the Zoom screen for that function, 
And if you would like to speak, please use the raise your hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. State your name prior to providing your comment, written or verbally. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and go into the, um, the participants to see if there's anyone with their hand raised. When I call on you, please allow us a few seconds to unmute you. First, we have Chris Duncan. All right. How's everybody doing tonight? Chris Duncan here. Great. Thank you. Uh, I, and I'm, I'm speaking not as a city council meeting, uh, member. I want to make sure, or a mayor. I'm, I'm, I want to be very clear that I'm speaking as a soccer dad, a cheer dad, and a San Clemente resident. Uh, you know, I just want to emphasize, I understand the presentation, and I know that OCTA is working with the city of San Clemente to, to uh, be more open to sand. But, you know, why is Brett Sanders would tell you that sand is the very best way to protect our, our bluffs. Uh, you know, it's the undermining of the bluffs by having sand be dissipated that, that has caused bluff failure. And it's, uh, it's also, it's also the, the lack of sand uh, and the ocean coming up against the riprap that causes even more sand erosion, right? So it seems like Brett Sanders would tell you, the scientists would tell you sand is the answer. It doesn't seem like that's the priority for OCTA. Uh, and that's going to that's gonna destroy our beaches and hurt our residents in San Clemente. So I just want to make sure uh, and we're on the record here. When I'm in the assembly, I'm going to bring hundreds of thousands of, of, of cubic yards of sand. But until then, we've got to have OCTA focus on more sand and less rocks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Next, we have Brian Yanity. Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, this is Brian Yanity of Fullerton. I am Vice President South of the Rail Passenger Association of California, which is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization representing the interests of rail passengers in the state since 1978. Uh, so, of course, we want rail service to continue un uninterrupted for passenger trains. Um, per the agreement, when OCTA purchased the Surfline track from the Santa Fe Railway in 1993, it is legally obligated to provide an operable railroad between Orange and San Diego County. Um, these obligations are to the Santa Fe successor BNSF Railway, Amtrak, and the Southern California Regional Rail Authority, or Metrolink. If the rock protection is needed to protect the track from major storms and high seas, then OCTA should pursue this solution in the short term. Um, sand replenishment alone, if that turns out to not protect the tracks, um, you know, from storm events, then, you know, we still need the rock. Um, ultimately, though, the only permanent solution is to move the rail line off the beach via new inland alignment, most likely along or beneath I-5. Um, in addition to obviously being good for rail service, it would also reduce the need for riprap and give the beach a better chance of surviving. And it's in everyone's interest to seek a permanent long-term solution um, as fast as possible. Um, but more on, you know, the freight obligation, especially, um, you know, OCTA <clears throat> has that obligation with their acquisition of the railroad track, and that discontinuance of rail service is not a local decision. Um, under federal law, this can only be decided by the Surface Transportation Board in Washington, D.C. It's a national consideration. OCTA, as a track owner, has a responsibility to manage this key national regional asset and needs to consider not just the local stakeholders, but also na national and regional stakeholders. The surf line plays a key role in the state and national economy and national defense. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, next, we have Susie Whitelaw. Hi, I would like to encourage everyone who is, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I would like to encourage everyone who is in this meeting, and it's I think it's inappropriate that we can't see all of the participants. If you are a participant and you would like to speak, you need to say in the question, answer, or raise your hand that you would like to speak. What was presented is a little bit misleading. The southernmost hotspot isn't a small little thing, and it's not on a private beach. It represents the entirety of the San Clemente State Beach, starting from north of Calafia all the way down to Cypress Shores. They are planning on putting in a 50-foot revetment when the high tide mark is within 50 feet of the tracks. There is an alternative, Save Our Beaches San Clemente. If you 
go to our website, we have developed an alternative plan that would only be $15 million to put in enough sand to at least for the next five years, uh, maintain those tracks and support those tracks. We also are working on a plan for North Beach because they are planning on, on putting in also a revetment that would extend all the way up to the swing sets at North Beach, if you're familiar with that. Um, their schedule that they have left off for this is that they want to begin construction on this within five months. And uh, Mr. Fu has stated they want to have this in before the next storm season. So this is really urgent. We need to keep on working on this and supporting our wonderful city manager and our city council people who are working to fight this. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Next, we have Dennis Kelly. Can you hear us, Dennis? Okay. Go ahead, Dennis. Hello. Go ahead, Dennis. Hi. Dennis Kelly, Professor Emeritus, Marine Science Department, Orange Coast College. And I also work with Save Our Beaches, San Clemente. I went down to the beach today at Califia State Beach, and I was shocked to see how much sand had been lost in just the last year. Uh, there's rocks on the beach, and the beach is very, very narrow now. And it used to be an extremely wide beach. And uh, I just want to reemphasize that uh, one of the key ways to solve this problem is not just to add more riprap to the coastline, but to add more sand to the coastline. And there are other sources of sand that are available that could be had rather cheaply and uh, widen the beach so that it protects the rail line and also uh, stabilizes that, that particular beach area. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to take one more um, oral comment, and then I'll I'll read a few um, in the Q and A. Next is Adriana Rizzo. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Adriana Rizzo. I'm a PhD candidate in Earth and Planetary Science at UC Riverside. Um, I live in Riverside, but uh, like to visit San Clemente for the beaches. Um, I typically ride the Metrolink Beach Tone, which has been, um, and I've been visiting San Clemente a lot less since the frequent close with the frequent track closures uh, on, on that rail line. Um, I think that um, preser preserving the rail line is essential is an essential part of the um, uh, of the uh, of our rights as, uh, uh, to ensure the right of every Californian for coastal access, and we need to do everything we can to ensure that real real operations are not constantly delayed. Um, the ultimate long term solution, which we really need to move quickly on, is moving the tracks inland. Um, this needs to be seriously considered, and we need we need to start getting those plans made now. Um, what all of the solutions like coastal erosion is is an inevitability it's 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 like gravity um it's it's going to be um as particularly with climate change increasing the frequency of winter storms and sea level rise um i guess i i, I support um whatever solutions necessary to keep the rail line in operation um including including uh including riprap uh sand replenishment is a uh, you know, is important for keeping the beaches wider, but it's a temporary solution as long as the erosion continues. It, I'm not confident it is sufficient to keep the rail lines in place. Um, and it's, you know, going to need to be done continuously. Um, so I think it's OCTA's first priority should be keeping the rail line in operation and ultimately moving, um, relocating the line to a way that is less susceptible to coastal erosion. Um, which would have the added added side effect of um, of resolving some of the issues with the beach. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, if we've called on you to make an oral comment and you had a similar comment um, in the Q and A, we're going to go ahead and move on to another another comment in the Q and A. Um, I'm going to primarily focus on questions, um, comments, as everyone can certainly view in the Q&A, but I want to make sure that we get to the questions in the Q&A as well. So the first is, why didn't OCTA evaluate relocating the tracks as an alternative? 
since they will eventually have to be moved off the beach for a variety of reasons? And that question comes in from Mike Barnes. The, and Lori um, had a question, the OC Register and San Diego Tribune have both indicated that OCTA plans to spend 200 million to preserve the tracks. Is this the anticipated amount to be spent for addressing the four areas? Is this amount expected to be spent the next six, nine or 12 months? From where will OCTA be obtaining these funds? And then I'd like to call on Michael Assay. He has his hand raised, and I know you also have a um, comment or question in the Q and A. If you would be so kind, um, we'll we'll go ahead and move on to you, Michael. Can you hear us, Michael? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, thank you. I'm, I probably got uh, perhaps more personal interest in this than, uh, than some others and probably a, a different view. Uh, I think we all need to remember that the, uh, the railroad's efforts to protect the tracks uh, also protect the bluffs and the homes behind the tracks. If we think San Clemente is plagued by bluff collapse and landslides now, wait until the railroad is gone and the surf crashes directly on the cliff faces. It'll make the Solana Beach problem look like a picnic. The real problem, and it's an evil one, is that the Coastal Commission refuses to allow groins and offshore breakwaters to be installed as sand retention devices, and or they, uh, they don't permit armoring of the bluffs to prevent collapse. The former devices are especially effective when strategically placed where the littoral uh, ocean drift is strong and directional. That is where the sand loss is greatest. The alternative to the sand retention devices and armoring is the, is the Coastal Commission's outrageous efforts to implement managed retreat. This strategy is to cheer on bluff collapse as it makes the new sand and so keeps the beaches sandy. Of course, the bluffs are already built to the edges, and so whatever is on top will also be destroyed. I say this tactic is evil as no compensation is offered to owners who, whose homes are destroyed. They must simply retreat. Indeed, where limited armoring is, is somehow allowed, the owners must pay the Coastal Commission compensation for the sand that somehow is not available. With these considerations in mind, we must strongly support the railroad's efforts to protect the trap tracks with the tried to true riprap. It's a logical solution for them to keep the trains running and it's readily available since simply they simply run the load down the tracks and dump it. Others are, are believed that the railroad should use sand since that was what pr mostly protected the pa uh, tracks in the past. This would make sense if the sand retention devices discussed above were available. The city studies the logic of such a, a solution, but the implementation awaits the change of mind of the Coastal Commission, and that's really where we ought to be focused our attention. In any event, this all down the road. Uh, for example, it's taken 10 years to get the small replacement of sand underway now at the pier. Furthermore, new sand without retention devices will simply disappear as quickly as been the case with the existing sand. You only need to look at Oceanside to see the troubles that they've had. Finally, others have argued that placing riprap exacerbates the sand loss. This is illogical on its face. You simply need to ask the question, what would happen to, if the, to the sand if the rocks weren't placed there? The obvious answer is that the loss of sand from inland progression will continue just as it has in the past. So this riprap uh, causes sand loss is, is simply a red herring. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to go back to um, some of the questions that I was reading and reread them. We were having some audio issues, so I apologize for that. So I'm going to go back and read a few of the of the comments that are in the Q&A. Um, Chris Duncan did speak earlier, but I want to go ahead and, and ask his question. It was, why is sand not being prioritized as the best way to protect both bluffs and the rail riprap? Uh, Dan, would you like to, to make a comment regarding that? Yes, thank you, Christina. So in response, and I, I think that was 
one of the recurring comments or themes in terms of the feedback that we have heard so far. In terms of prioritizing SAN, we are prioritizing SAN to the um, to the um, to the extent that we can to protect the railroad. The complication, and I've brought this up at previous meetings, is being able to permit the rocks and the sand simultaneously. So that's the challenge. And if you look at examples, for, for instance, and, and I realize it, it may be construed as apples to oranges, when you look at the US Army Corps of Engineers sand project that they're partnering with the city of San Clemente currently, whereby approximately 250,000 cubic yard of sand is going to be placed, and I believe it's sometime the, um, during the next month when they're coming back to do that, um, that construction work, if you will. That particular project was initiated over two decades ago. So even if you were to look at a much, much shorter timeline, you're looking at years away in terms of getting the meaningful amount of sand there to protect the railroad as well as um, the bluffs behind the railroad and so forth. So it's really about expediency. And that's why I had emphasized earlier those immediate actions were looking at protecting the railroad while we're looking for short and midterm solutions. But in the meantime, if we don't do anything and we can't get the sand out there in an expeditious manner, then basically the railroad is just going to get washed away and then you're going to have issues behind the railroad, which are basically the bluffs and then eventually the properties behind, behind the, the, the hillside. So I think from a standpoint of whether or not OCT is prioritizing sand, we are looking at sand. I want to make it very clear. It's about implementation timeframe, whether or not we can coincide the placement of sand with the placement of riprap to protect the railroad in this place, in, in this case. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to go back to Mike Barnes's question. Why didn't o the OCTA evaluate relocating the tracks as an alternative? since they will eventually have to be moved off the beach for a variety of reasons. Maybe you could talk about the long-term study. Yeah, I touched on this in my presentation. I apologize if I kind of went through that really fast. There, there was a slide where it showed the short midterm on the left side and then the right side, the long-term study. We parsed it out into two different efforts. And the reason for that is, yes, there will need to be some sort of consideration for what I, co what I call coastal retreat strategies whether that's relocating the, the rail line to um, somewhere along the five or adjacent to. In fact, low sand, the state agency had looked at something like this back between 2002 to about 2009, but there, um, it was for a different purpose. And because of the uh, feedback from the local community, they decided to go with a no project alternative. And so if, uh, not so much if, when, there is consideration to look at the long term, that's going to need to be revisited in terms of the work that LOSAN did, even though it's for a different purpose in this case, it may not be for the same purpose as what LOSAN had looked at it, but that's that needs to be a, a separate effort. And then the other point that I made earlier is when you look at SANDAG and what they're trying to do with relocating 1.7 mile of their coastal rail line to an inland alternative, that's taken them a while, and, and it's going to take them a while before anything comes to fruition. Now, when you're looking at the situation in Orange County, you're looking at orders of magnitude more complicated, given it's seven miles that you're looking at instead of approximately two miles or 1.7 mile of the railroad that you're looking at to be relocated you know, down in San Diego. So hence, we're looking at the short and midterm to what we call protecting it in place while we're looking at you know, longer term solutions with respect to coastal retreat and potentially relocation of the rail line. Thank you, Dan. I'm gonna go back to Lori. She had a comment, the OC or the question, the Orange County Register and San Diego Tribune have both indicated that OCT plans to spend 200 million to preserve the tracks. Is this the anticipated amount to be spent for addressing the four areas? And is this amount expected to be spent in the next six, nine, or 12 months? And from where are these funds coming? So maybe I'll kind of go backward. Um, 
first off, there is no project. These, and I emphasize that during the presentation, they're, they're simply concepts that we have looked at, four areas that are that that are that have identified to have imminent threat as far as potentially causing another shutdown of the railroad. And we have talked about this at length in terms of five closures in three years. So these are four areas that we have looked at. As far as the funding or funding is concerned, there is no funding identified with respect to, I know the number 200 million, that 200 million, and we have made this very clear along the way, is a very rough planning level, 10,000 foot order of magnitude kind of ballpark, not even really uh, with, with a lot of you know, detail at a, as I emphasize, 10,000 foot level that it could cost in terms of even shoring up those four areas that we're talking about. And in terms of timing, um, depending on the on the urgency and what happens with, and, and I emphasize this earlier, I talked about this earlier, one of the four areas has already been set in motion. We identified it, meaning area number three with the inland uh, situation with, um, with the Mariposa Bridge. We identify that particular area. Unfortunately, that actually set in motion with respect to the landslide in January, hence causing a closure of the railroad and all the issues that we have talked about. So when you're looking at even the four areas, one of the four areas had already been set in motion as far as kind of the issues that we're having to face with. So yes, we would like to address the effectively the four areas as soon as we can. As far as price tag, we don't really know exactly what it's going to be. It's a rough order of magnitude. And then finally, is there funding identified? No, there is no funding identified for that. So it's really at this point, as I as I said, 10,000 foot level kind of concept that we're looking at just to get an idea of order of magnitude of what we're talking about. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to go back to some of our oral commenters. Joe Wilson, um, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, but <laughs> there are a number of misstatements here so far, but I'll just hit the main points I want to make tonight is I'm quite keen to know how your emergency coastal rail project fits in with this coastal rail resilience resiliency study because there's some very important elements included in both. Maybe a lot of people on the call don't know that OCTA has an emergency coastal rail project. In a presentation provided last month laid out a three-phase project with railway protection construction starting in five months in the north and south of San Clemente, meaning a start this August with construction, which is now four months away. And the presentation listed a rough order of magnitude with all the money that we've heard about tonight, but also specified a construction of a half mile of a wall, a half mile of rock placement, and two thirds of a mile of engineered revetment. But that presentation only shows a short timeline. What I'm keen to know tonight and what I'm most interested in is something you said at the time, Mr. Fu, which was essentially, we need to get ahead of the next storm season. Phase one would be initiating agency coordination and regulatory permitting. We've already begun that process with the Army Corps of Engineers and the California Coastal Commission. So I know these are listening sessions, but in the last session, you did respond to a couple of the questions. Could you please just take a few seconds tonight and let us know the status of your emergency plans in that presentation? which may actually start construction in a few short months, and in fact are included as part of the study under discussion tonight. Finally, to correct uh, a little bit of misinformation tonight, riprap does in fact increase coastal erosion when the ocean is allowed to hit it. Many studies prove this, and if you wanna see the science in action, take a walk to Cypress shore on the small beach uh, that remains. And sand in fact will not just wash away uh, our coastal bite or bay between Cotton's Point, Cotton's Point and Dana Point tends to retain sand in the near shore area. So replenishment efforts, although they may need to be regular, uh, will in fact be the best method for protecting the tracks. So thank you for this opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. So I will respond to the um, question about 
the emergency permit for these four areas? The short answer is no. There is no emergency permit issue or authorized by the Coastal Commission for these four areas. However, I, uh, I do want to uh, share that, and I think I've shared this in, in the past, we have had conversations with the Coastal Commission staff about these four areas and the imminent threat for, for, uh, for which these four areas uh, we believe have posed or will pose to the integrity of the railroad and in which one of those four areas have already, as I uh, have talked about, had already been set in motion. So as far as a coastal emergency coastal development permit for these four areas, we do not have one. We do not have any authorization. And as far as the timeline, that was a hypothetical. If we were to need to set everything in motion predicated on Coastal Commission's um, basically discretion to authorize an emergency permit and so on and so forth, that's what we could hypothetically do. But by no means are we going to be able to actually go out there and do anything until such time that we have had the clear communication with the Coastal Commission. And to that end, I want to also talk about the fact that we have had ongoing conversations with both the Coastal Commission and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on what we have reviewed up to this point and the fact that um, they're well aware, the Coastal Commission and the Corps, are aware of the feedback from the community as far as the sand is concerned in, in terms of integrating sand as part of what I call the project feature as part of the solution. And so we have had those discussions with both of those agencies and we're continuing to have discussions with both of those agencies to ensure that we can try to expedite the process to the best that we can. But at this point, we do not have a project because those conversations are ongoing and there has been no authorization from the Coastal Commission as far as an emergency permit for those very four areas that we're talking about. So I do want to clarify, yes, we've had previous emergencies, for instance, at Cypress Shore, for which there was an emergency CDP that was authorized by the Coastal Commission, but that's for the Cypress Shore work back in fall of 2021 with the riprap placement. And I believe in summer or spring of 2022 with the tieback solution. So that's a whole different you know, situation, even though the area number four is in a, in, um, a close proximity. They're not in the same area to the previous work that I had just alluded to. Thank you, Dan. Now I'm going to go to Lisa Gantz. Hello? Hi, Lisa, we can hear you. Hi. Uh, why should we trust OCTA um, when you've ruthlessly dropped boulders on our southernmost beach in San Clemente and devastated that beach? OCTA's recent proposal of millions of dollars worth of seawall and boulders belies your interest in seriously addressing our concerns as a beach community. Over and over again, expertise has been shared with OCTA that sand replenishment is the environmentally responsible solution to railroad and beach resiliency, yet there is no serious effort to include sand replenishment in any of OCTA's proposals. There is, however, a disregard for the expert testimony that has been repeatedly shared with OCTA. And OCTA has not really made any proactive effort at trying to add sand replenishment. Instead, you bypass environmental oversight with the emergency permitting. Boulders and seawalls fly in the face of the city's plans to protect and restore our eroding beaches. The eventuality of such actions is water crashing against rocks with the complete devastation of the beach. Adding sand once this happens will most likely fail. The railroad should not take precedence over an entire beach community. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I'm now to, going to go to Tony Nelson's written comment. She or question, excuse me. She says, "Has OCTA studied the impact of train vibrations on the vulnerable rain-soaked bluffs that line the coastal corridor?" 
Have there been any efforts to monitor not just movement, but moisture levels and vibration? Dan, do you have anything you'd want to share with that? Yes, thank you, Christina, and thank you, Tony, for that comment. We have heard that comment, I believe, from you in the past, Tony, and we are going to look into whether or not that, that makes sense on a go-forward basis with the larger study. As, as I indicated, this is a two-year study. We just started this, so that is something we'll look into and determine if it's appropriate for the purpose of this study. Um, and, and the other thing I want to talk about or just briefly touch on is this particular study is a planning level study. It strives to identify issues and solutions, whether it's on a short term or on a midterm, there will be follow on activities that are gonna be needed um, when we identify those issues and then those will eventually get vetted more uh, in more detail. And so we'll have to determine the appropriate time to, to basically implement this if it makes sense. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, Monica, uh, you're next. Can you hear us, Monica? Is Monica, Monica, are you still there? I'm trying. Hi, can you hear me? No, we can hear you. Go right ahead. All right. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Monica Draghisi, and I'm here speaking as a resident of San Clemente and as a mom. Part of the reason why my family and I were attracted to the sea uh, to begin with is undoubtedly its beautiful beaches and culture. I'm here to express my strong opposition to the current proposal for the coastal rail resiliency approach. It comes at a cost that is too high and not acceptable, which is significant loss of coastal access. Public beach access is a right, and we should not be using public funds to impede it in any way. I believe you will be hard pressed to find many residents of, in San Clemente that will be in agreement with this current approach when they, once they understand the tremendous changes that it will bring to our beaches. The community is learning about this issue and our voices will continue to get stronger and louder. I urge you to work on alternatives that maintain our beach access and not take away from it. The railroad needs to coexist in this community, not dramatically alter a key part of what makes the city so special and destroy its beautiful natural resources. Your solution must prioritize sand and um, ideally not rip wrap boulders. I urge you to work with our city on a better path forward. Thank you for the time and for engaging with us and for the opportunity to provide this feedback. Thank you, Monica. Now we're gonna go to Shirley Weiss. Okay, uh, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shirley Weiss and I'm a resident of San Diego County, specifically Del Mar, California. And I'm going to ask OCTA the same thing that I'm asking NCTD and SANDAG. And that is to do nothing to undermine or circumvent the Coastal Act. The Coastal Act compliance is necessary both under state and federal law, uh, compliance with that law is necessary to ensure that for all of the armoring and re-engineering and uglifying of the beaches that are taking place in favor of the rail industry, the residents and the coastal cities receive adequate mitigation. If you apply for emergency permits or other kinds of permits, or petition the legislature to circumvent the Coastal Act, what you are doing is depriving us of getting something at least in return for what you're taking away massively throughout the coast. Uh, what the re-engineering that is going on in San Diego and perhaps in San Clemente, I'm less knowledgeable about that, but in San Diego and, and San Clemente is re-engineering is a massive subsidy to the freight industry. Yes, there are passengers that travel up and down the coast, but the freight industry is getting a huge free ride here that we would never afford the airline industry. And what's happening here is they're taking away our beaches, 
They're taking away our California constitutional right to access to the beaches, all in the name of really freight passage. Uh, I do understand that we have to coexist with the railroad. There should be enough engineering to allow for transportation until, freight transportation until uh, the tracks are moved off of the bluff. I do un understand that. But Sandag's um, push to re-engineer the entire bluff for 50 years and OCTAs for 30 years is over-armoring and over-engineering of the bluffs. And I respectfully request that you rethink that. You rethink whether or not the millions and millions of dollars that not the railroad industry is spending, that we're spending, we taxpayers are spending to subsidize that industry and are paying the price of losing our beaches and losing our coast is all uh, the right way to go. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, we have a question here from Andy Hall, the efforts to protect the rail line by placing riprap on the existing revetment was conducted using an emergency permit issued by the Coastal Commission. The only method to get sand on the beach in a reasonable time frame to protect the revetment would be to obtain an emergency permit from the Coastal Commission to place sand on the beach in those same areas. Is OCTA willing to submit an application for an emergency permit to place sand on the beach? This would be the best short-term solution. The only proven way to push the water westward is sand. Sand is the answer to many of the problems being illustrated in the presentation. Would you like to speak? There you go, Dan. Yes, so I, I'm looking at the comment. I think the, the, the very question is OCK willing to submit an application for an emergency permit to place the sand on the beach. The short answer is yes, we would be willing to consider that but I think what is important to um, emphasize is we want to be able to do our part along with everyone else, whether it's the city, the county, and any, anyone else along the coast. So that is a conversation that I have alluded to that, that we have already begun with the Coastal Commission and with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as far as finding ways to see what we can do collectively, that's the key word, to streamline the process such that everyone's interest is protected. OCTA being the railroad operator, protecting its interest with respect to the railroad, while also trying to meet the interests of the local communities with her loud and clear with regard um, to the sand. So I think that's the sh uh, hopefully the short answer that answers the, uh, the question. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Eva Stromer, could you please speak? Can you hear us, Eva? Hi, thank you so much. I have... Go ahead. I have have two comments and, and um, I am um, a lucky and fortunate resident of San Clemente and, and love the area as much as each and every one of you who are, are attending this meeting. And I want to point out two things. First of all, the OCTA or the operation of the railroads is, is mandatory and, and important for us from an economic standpoint. Secondly, there are other aspects that should be considered. And I would like to know, and I'd appreciate perhaps Mr. Hall might want to address this. If, if OCTA and the city and Coastal Commission plan to allow for any kind of protective building of, of individual homeowners to protect their properties. That's question number one. Question number two is, is has OCTA discussed with the Coastal Commission and the city building services to evaluate bluff conditions in addition to their standard reviews? Because it doesn't appear that they are considering anything of what's gone on here in the last year and a half. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Strummer. Um, Dan, would you like to um, address any of those questions? Yes, uh, obviously I won't touch on the one um, question directed to Mr. Hall, but I will touch on the one, I believe it was a question about whether or not OCTA would look at addressing the bluffs. Um, we would be looking at solutions as part of the, the larger two-year study to look at what are the root of the problems that's leading to all, all of those landslides that we have been experiencing over the last handful of years. But I do want to emphasize what, what complicates the situation is the different ownership. So OCTA owns the railroad right away. There's a certain width it meanders in terms of the, the width. And so outside of that is basically the hillside or the, or the bluffs to the inland side. And that's private property ownership. So, and in some instances, I believe there's also state uh, state parks as well as the city. So we would be working with all of those neighbors and collaborating with them. But the, at the end of the day, if there are issues and, and as a result, solutions that we identified that are not on OCTAs right away, it would be incumbent upon those appropriate property owners or property owner to address those issues. And, and perhaps we will work with them to the extent that is possible if it involves um, any sort of um, encroachment or what have you on the railroad. But if it's outside of our right of way, um, it would be incumbent upon those property owners to, to kind of take the lead on those efforts. So hopefully that answers the question. Dan, um, Tony Nelson also had another question. Does your 30-year plan take into account anticipated climate change effects such as sea level rise? And are you calculating the erosive effects of the riprap, which will seriously exasperate, exasperate erosion? So the first part is looking at sea level rise. Yes, that is part of the equation, if you will, in terms of looking at um, the climate change, sea level rise over the next 30 years. And, and obviously, if we're going to uh, remain in place, building and uh, building up the resiliency for that. And then as far as the riprap, we have been in discussions um, with the likes of Dr. Brett Sanders, who have had multiple meetings with him. We are talking to other coastal scientists, whether it's um, coastal scientists from you know other parts of the state or anybody who's looked at kind of coastal um, erosion as well as resiliency over their, um, in, in their career. So we, we are basically talking to all of the experts out there and making sure that we educate ourselves. It's not just Dr. Brett Sanders. There are, are other renowned coastal scientists that are out there that we would very much like to um, talk to and, and obviously continue that conversation. So that is going to be part of the, the larger two-year effort. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm gonna go back to those with your hand raised. Um, next is Teresa Nelson. Can you hear us, Teresa? Hello? Hi. Hi, sorry, this is Chris Nelson. Uh, my wife, I'm on my wife's computer, but Not a problem. Uh, thank you uh, very much um, for uh, helping us fix our bluffs here in Cypress Shore. Um, I've been, uh, my family's had a house here on the bluff uh, above the riprap uh, up here since 1984. And so we're very uh, uh, impacted by by this whole thing. And I think your riprap has definitely made our beach deeper and, and worse. And it's, it's, it, it's making the problem worse rather than solving it. I'd like to, to, to flip this thing upside down and, and are you guys mainly dealing with the symptoms versus the disease? What has caused this change? This isn't sea rise. If it was sea rise, I think we'd all be uh, dealing with it uh, differently. But my, 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 it can't be a coin ink that the nuclear plant put in a, uh, a, a artificial man-made reef based the Coastal Commission said the water was warming and they were killing fish. So they put in a man-made reef. They put in three different... Uh, um, uh, parts of this thing over the last two decades, and everyone they put in 
our sand gets worse. You can see from your own pictures from 2013, we used to have a hundred foot beach, at least a hundred foot beach. I can show you ones from 99 was even better. But anyway, it's it can't be a coin dink. The more they put that artificial reef in, we, we get our beach back every winter because it comes from the north, but we've lost getting sand from the south, which is where they put the reef in. And so I really think if we could hold the, the utility company responsible, that turns out that they are a cause of both us losing our sand and you guys losing your, your railroad access, it seems like we could hold the utility, you know, for the nuclear plant since it's closed now, we don't care about the warming of the water. Why can't we get those guys to take the reef out and, and, and get Humpty Dumpty back together again? Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Um, I'm now gonna go to Amanda Quintanilla. Can you hear us, Amanda? Can you hear us, Amanda? Hello. Hi, Amanda, we can hear you, go right ahead. <laughs> oh, great, thank you, hi. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for this uh, listening um, session. And thank you to Andy Hall. I know he's been busy all week long, so I appreciate his, him tuning in and uh, making some comments and asking a question. And uh, what I wanted to say is when reading the Coastal Resiliency uh, Study, the initial assessment technical memorandum, it states the following. While the init this initial assessment is limited to to immediate actions to be performed by the railroad. The short and medium term solutions being explored will not be limited to the narrow scope and will consider other regional solutions such as sand replenishment, seawalls and groins, breakwaters as well. Uh, and that is on page four of that, um, of that uh, presentation. And I uh, just wanted to say, I hope that the OCTA makes a commitment to sand replenishment as mentioned. And um, I think that, um, I think there's a, several questions and comments as, that came about in regards to an article. So I'm glad that um, you're, you're clearing that up. And I think that uh, the, um, that, uh, Mr. Daryl Johnson, OCTA a director at this, uh, in his comments, uh, basically uh, clarified some misunderstanding about that. So uh, that was um, at the at the meeting uh, this on Monday. So there is some clarification about the, the 200 million. And um, so I just wanted to point that out. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your time. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm going to read a question in the Q&A from Kyle Heidelman. Is the agency applying for any emergency funding for relocating the tracks inland away from the coast? I fear that we don't have decades to permanently solve this problem in light of climate change. So Christina, I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, as far as the OCTA requesting or looking for funding for the actual relocation, um, that has not been done. Uh, and the reason for that is the study itself, in terms of the relocation study or the coastal retreat strategy has not been undertaken. Um, there has been discussions with the state of California to determine if it makes sense for the state to actually lead that effort. And the reason for that is while OCTA currently owns the seven mile right away within the coastal stretch of the railroad. Uh, if it were to be relocated, it would be relocated to a property that is not currently owned by OCTA. And when you kind of look at, um, at least from a logical standpoint, another public facility that would be along the, uh, the five and which is why there's been discussions with the state and the state uh, DOT or uh, Department of Transportation or Caltrans is the owner and operator on the I-5 freeway. And so therefore it would make more sense to have that discussion with the state to lead the effort should the railroad be relocated to an alignment, uh, for instance, on the five or, or even uh, adjacent to the five. So that's kind of where we are with respect to the long-term study. Thank you, Dan. 
Next, we're going to go to um, Rich. My apologies. I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Um, H-E-I-N-E. -E. If you're still with us, we would love to have you speak. Good evening. Thank you for calling on me. And I just want to make kind of a quick comment on Brian's earlier comment about uh, taking the the railroad inland, maybe along a five or uh, underneath the five, again, very expensive. Uh, I would like uh, to know if there's some consideration of maybe taking that railroad in from uh, San Juan Capistrano behind San Clemente and through Camp Pendleton hooking up there, which would uh, make it a whole lot less expensive, I believe, and uh, just thought that should be included in any thoughts. And in the previous comments by our moderator, it sounds like that is occurring. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Um, next, we have Wendy Morris. Hello? Hi, Wendy, we can hear you. Go right okay. ahead. Thank you for uh, having this listening session. I'm trying not to repeat any of the great comments that have already been made. But um, I have a few other ideas. Uh, one is, has anybody thought about getting sand from behind dams? There is dams that are being taken down, <clears throat> excuse me, being taken down, and there's dams that are the reservoirs are filling up. Um, there's lots of sand behind these dams that um, could possibly be used for our beach. Um, since we're not getting the sand from, say, not much from uh, our San Juan Creek because they're also mining sand up, up river for us. So that's another idea is, um, you know, we need to use all the sand that's available to us. Um, and if we're going to eventually move, move the tracks eventually, I wanna make sure that some type of mitigation is, is considered for all this, the riprap and the um, other mechanisms that the OCTA is going to use for their more immediate uh, uh, projects. Will there be any mitigation to take those things out and uh, return the beach to more sand and, and not just the riprap that I, I see or the um, possibility of a you know breakwater or the groins? Um, if the if that's being considered. Um, and I, I want to make one other comment about from the lady who talked about you know, wanting to take the, the train to the beach. And I'm gonna say that, well, <laughs> if, if the beach is gone, then I don't think she's gonna to wanna to come to the beach on the train because uh, there, there won't be any beach here. Uh, so that's just, just another idea. Um, one more point. I want to know why it's taken so long to get sand onto the beach as far as uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. Because the surf rider, when I was involved in it 20 years ago, we were trying to get sand back then. And it's, it's taken over 20 years to get that sand to the point of almost being on our beaches now. So um, that's that's another thing. Why Why can't we get some emergency sand on the beach. We seems like the OCTA can get, build an emergency revetment or put in emergency riprap or put in these little walls to keep the bluff from falling onto the railroad tracks, but we can't seem to get an emergency placement of sand. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Nick Gates had a written question. Why is the only solution just dumping rocks on the beach? There should be multiple options that include additional sand, cliff stabilization, and preserving the environment. Why not use temporary barriers that can be removed if an ocean storm event is going to occur? I'm not sure, Dan, if there's anything you could add to that um, as far as um, temporary barriers. Um, I'm going to now call on Rob Kramer. He has his hand raised. Can you hear us, Rob? Yeah, hi. 
Hello. Hello. I'm Rob. <laughs> My name is Rob Kramer, a resident of San Clemente. I enjoy the trains. It's part of San Clemente's identity and understand the importance of the riprap to the tracks. But I also understand when the ocean waves crash against this riprap, it slowly washes the sand away. How can we add this riprap without destroying our beaches? Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Bruce Gillings, are you with us? There we go. Yeah, can you hear me now? We can. Thank you, Bruce. Great. Great. Uh, Bruce Gillings, I'm a resident of Mission Viejo. Uh, I'm also an advisor to North American Freight Forum and On Track North America. Um, I'd like to uh, commend OCTA for working on solutions to keep the railroad operating. Um, it's been there for 136 years, long before any of the homes were built. And its connectivity to the rest of the nation for San Diego County for freight and passengers is, is critical to the national network. Uh, Mr. Yannity said earlier that uh, he raised good points about a condition of the sale was uh, the freight service must be maintained. And that includes federal requirements. The tracks are also part of the StrackNet National Railroad Defense Network. Um, the environmental impacts of the interrup interruptions also need to be considered. Passengers are forced to use autos or buses and freight is forced onto trucks. Emissions go up by varying degrees, negatively impacting both local coastal communities as well as inland communities. Finally, I would like to support OCTA in looking at not just protecting the existing railroad, but also in providing added capacity on the tracks to encourage conversion of more passengers out of autos onto Amtrak and Metrolink and more freight out of over-the-road trucks onto BNSF. Historically, there was a siding for trains to meet in San Clemente, south of the pier. Uh, I believe there was one also uh, between Doheny and the, the, the Ollie Hansen uh, uh, rec center, uh, adding a second track from the San Clemente Metrolink station north up to Doheny, up to the Sarah siding, as well as reinstalling the original siding south of the pier would add capacity. The short-term goal uh, until a final permanent solution and alignment is agreed upon and constructed should include the environmental, environmentally friendly goals of increasing use of Amtrak, Metrolink, and BNS for, BNSF freight trains. And I encourage OCTA to look at adding capacity for the short-term solutions that are come up with. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Dan, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that I see in the Q&A, and maybe you can address them um, together. One of the questions is regarding whether or not we're actually looking into any of the San at Prado Dam. So if you could speak to any analysis we may be doing in that regard. Um, and then also there was a question regarding if we're considering artificial reefing near the shoreline. Maybe I'll jump to the second question first regarding artificial reef. Um, as I noted earlier, we have not begun looking at the short and midterm solutions. We wanted to uh, basically engage the stakeholders and we've heard a lot of really, really good uh, feedback and comments through today, uh, to date. And so we have not looked into that. Um, although that is a possibility, we're looking at everything that's uh, anything out there that's a possibility to help improve, whether it's the, the the provide coastal resiliency and as well as protecting the railroad. So I don't want to necessarily discount it without uh, ever having done any of the analysis. That's the um, I think to that end. And then the question about the sand source, um, as far as looking at sand source or sources. OCTA had actually been in discussion with the County of Orange, as well as others going back as far as last summer to talk about where there may be potential. And mind you, this is actually before we retain the engineering team that's before us to even initiate this study. So this is something prompted by our staff members in talking to the county um, about where there may be logical sand stockpile sites 
to determine in the, not so much if, it's in the event that we need the sand, how do we get the sand in a most expeditious ma manner, in a most um, environmentally friendly manner, if you will, to the area down in South Orange County. So that discussion have been ongoing. I did hear a comment from one of the commenters about uh, earlier about why it's taken so long. And that is the conversation we're having with the likes of Coastal Commission, and we will continue to have with the Coastal Commission and the US Army Corps of Engineers to see ways to try to streamline uh, both the sand permitting and the riprap, if we need both, um, we, we do believe in order to truly protect the integrity of the railroad, we will need both. And so what are ways that is a win-win for, for everyone? So as far as the sand uh, source, we have looked at Prado Dam, we have looked at San An An River um, and you know other creeks and so on and so forth. And even uh, offshore barge, um, method which is being employed by the Army Corps of Engineers currently with their 250,000 cubic yard sand project. So we're even looking at offshore possibilities. So um, we, we are continuing to explore all of those possibilities and trying to find ways to basically kind of the key, the key here with respect to sand is how do we get whatever volume that we're looking at and it's, it's gonna be a lot to the area in an expeditious manner, because when you're looking at trucking, that's going to require thousands and tens of thousands of truckloads, depending on what the volume you're talking about. And then the same could be said for rail cars. You're going to need to have a lot of um, trips with rail cars. But what is really not uh, commonly known outside of kind of the rail railroad operator is there's a certain work window. Everything is slotted because you only have one rail line and so there's only so much time in the day but literally it's 24 hours in the day and you can only have um there's a schedule whether you know for the freight operators for the passenger operators so how do we fit ourselves into that already very busy schedule with respect to what we call a work window so those are all very complicated situations or very complicated um dimensions that we're trying to work through and we're exploring any and all possibilities as far as kind of going back to the sand source and where we can expeditiously, you know, get the sand, get the right type of sand. I think that's also key as well as being able to effectively and, and efficiently get the sand to the site where we need or where we need it, which in this case is within the city of San Clemente, South Orange County. Thank you, Dan. Um, in the interest of time, since we're approaching 6.30, I'm going to call on individuals with their hands raised that we haven't had a chance to call on yet. Um, and we'll go from there and then we'll wrap up the presentation. So next I'd like to go to Matthew Schmidt. Hello. Hi, Matthew, go right ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, speak, yes. speaking as a San Clemente resident and a longtime surfer, um, Dan, I want to say I do not want to be in your shoes. You're doing a great job. <laughs> um, it's a it's a lose lose situation with Mother Earth, um, but I feel like we're pushing a causation over a correlation here with putting more riprap on the beach, and I would like to understand a little further whether the east side of the track has been the closure point of contention versus the west side of the track. Thank you. Okay, hey, so on, uh, on that note, I think what I'll do is I'll ask one of our engineers, either Rob or George, you kind of quickly touch on that. I know we're uh, getting into the uh, half hour, but, but that is something good for us to touch on. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, I'm Rob Klofsky with HDR. Can you please try to help me better understand the question. I was a little confused by the question.
I think he's no. Oh. Matthew, are you still yeah, here? no, no, I'm here now. I'm not unmuted. I'm not muted anymore. Yeah. Hey, um, so it, like, so just to put it uh, kind of anecdotally, right. But bluff collapse is ca caused by stormwater runoff and beach erosion. Right. But to a certain extent, I think that a lot of our bluff collapse, which has caused a lot of the closures in the past three years is said, has been stormwater runoff. And if you look at kind of, uh, it, 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 they can't be unintertwined, but correlation does not mean causation, right? So dumping a bunch of rock on the beach might not solve your closure issue, I guess is where I'm getting at. So, so I, I, I think that's a, that's a, I, I think it's a, it's a, those are two unrelated things here, right? So we've identified, we've gone through and identified, looked through the corridor and identified areas of risk and uh, what potentially can shut down the railroad in the future. So you're right. Uh, the last, last two, uh, uh, last two events that have shut down the railroad uh, stemming from Casa Romanica and uh, Mariposa happened inland, uh, basically bluff collapse for a, a, a variety of reasons, stormwater runoff, uh, the, the, these, the, these slopes are unstable. And so, uh, so we've had to shut down the railroad, build these encatchment walls to retain or contain the, the risk of, uh, these landslides so we can open up the railroads. Casa Romanica, I, I, sorry, Cypress Shores was a different situation. Uh, that was actually tr an ancient landslide that was triggered by loss of sand that uh, that unlocked the ancient landslide where the toe of that landslide was caused by, uh, was, you know, for, for thousands of years was held down by the sand. And so uh, in order to stabilize that one, temporarily to stop stop it from moving uh we had to load up the toe of that slope so that one was actually was actually caused by loss of sand so those are two different events so when we look at uh when we look at the we have the four areas identified three of them are our exposure to the west side from from the from the ocean and area three is is uh, from uh, the risk uh along this long slope, uh, long, uh, long slope, uh, that one is identified by extending that, uh, that encatchment wall to, uh, basically try to catch any future landslides, uh, such as Mariposa, uh, and Casa Romanica. So we don't have to shut down service. So if something fails, we're able to clean it, clean up and continue rail service pretty quickly. The three areas to the to the that are uh, presenting risk to, uh, from the ocean side that Dan talked about, uh, two of the areas are uh, already armored or partially armored. They they just need additional rock potentially to fill some of the gaps because over time those sections have eroded from uh, getting a, a, a from the from wave action. The third area is actually area that had plenty of beach, so it wasn't necessarily protected as Dan described, but now the beach has gone away. And so you see, you saw that that one exhibit that Dan showed where you had that person standing there. And really there was very there's maybe some some rocks here and there, but there was a there's a segment of this thing where it's completely exposed. So the next storm, that's going to completely wash away the railroad. So when you look at, uh, you know, one area versus the other, we had to take a look at the entire stretch of this coastline to see where are the risks of immediate storms or events uh, or it, that can take the railroad out of service. Because the goal is to try to stop going into these emergencies so we can operate the railroad while... OCTA has the opportunity to study short, midterm solutions and ultimately 
hopefully a long-term solution. I, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Rob. Um, we're going to call on just three more people um, in the interest of time since we're already past 630. So next, I'll be calling on Gary Walsh. Can you hear us, Gary? There we go. Now, can you hear me? Yes, Gary, thank you. Okay. Say, so, uh, what I wanted to talk about earlier, Andy Hall had uh, requested if uh, OCTA was going to apply for an emergency permit for SAN. And I just want to say that uh, Mr. Foos uh, uh, had somewhat of a, a disingenuous answer about that. I'll get to that in a second. But what I want to talk about is the fact of using SAN and using RIPRAP, which OCTA continually says they're going to do, and how that would work. Well, you have to put sand down first. You can't put the riprap down first because if you put the riprap down first, it's going to negate any ability to put sand down because it will eliminate the beach and all the processes, most of them anyway, that are anywhere successful and cheap to put uh, sand down require a beach to be there first. You guys know this. So uh, when Mr. Fu says that uh, he's a in the process for applying a permit that they want other entities to also be involved in this, why would it matter if it's gonna save your beach? I mean, if you know, not just save your beach, but save your tracks. Why would it matter if other entities are involved? You, you don't need other entities to help you uh, with the riprap, so why worry about it with the beach? Uh, but we can, here's my plan. Uh, tomorrow morning, the California Coastal Commission is having a meeting and everybody can speak at this meeting. You can register on their website. You can register tonight for that meeting tomorrow morning and speak in the general comments. And I am going to request that the California Coastal Commission issue a emergency permit for OCTA to put down sand. Not riprap, but for sand. And everybody can do this. So I would encourage everybody to go to the California Coastal Commission website, navigate your way through. You'll find the meetings tab and register and comment to the California Coastal Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, next, we have Jeff Berg. Hello, can you uh, hear yes, me? Yes, we can. Thank thanks. you. Yeah, first of all, thanks again for the uh, sessions. I think this is the third or fourth that a number of us had participated in. And uh, which we appreciate. But on the other hand, we'd encourage you, you know, if they're listening sessions and you you uh, hear some good information, maybe you guys could incorporate it into the presentation because you continue to present Dr. Sanders slide showing the difference between North County beaches and South County beaches in a somewhat disingenuous manner. Those beaches are wider because they've had sand replenishment programs for decades. And then also, when you talk about, you know, 20 plus years for San Clemente to get a, a sand project, which is a, way too long, but you're, you're cherry picking data, sand replenishment programs happen all the time, there's recurring programs. And that leads me to the question, which Gary uh, alluded to, Mr. Hall's question was quite direct. And your answer was, well, you, you need to consult with other people. When you guys request an emergency application for RIPRAP, are you working with other agencies and stakeholders like the city of San Clemente, or are you guys just doing that unilaterally? Would love to hear that answer. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more um, person we'll be calling on, Andrea Purnell. Hi, um, I'm a resident of San Clemente um, and indefinitely in favor of adding sand to the beach and less riprap as it does cause the waves to, to come in with such a force that it draws more sand back out to the ocean. However, my point is rather than the reactive solutions that we've been discussing, I'd like to see something more proactive with groins or an artificial reef to lessen the impact of the waves on the beach. If we could 
kind of hit it where the source is, I think that would help both the beaches, obviously, and the railroad tracks. Um, San Clemente depends on those tracks for our economy, brings in lots of tourists, um, and our community needs that. So we are definitely in favor of the railroad, but I think taking a more proactive approach rather than reactive needs to be done as well as sand replenishment. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. Thank you again for um, joining us this evening. We do have another general public listening session coming up on May 30th. It will be an in-person meeting held at San Clemente City Hall. So if you know of anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to participate in a listening session thus far, please encourage them to attend. Additional information is available on the OCTA website under plans and studies. And there's um, more information regarding the Coastal Rail Resiliency Study there as well. Next slide, please. This is the best way to get a hold of Dan Fu and myself. This is our direct um, phone number as well as our email addresses. If you have any um, comments or questions after this evening, feel free to reach out to us. And this is the direct project website um, listed down here below, octa.net backslash CRRS. You can go to that website and get more information regarding that in-person listening session coming up in May. Next slide, please. Thank you again for your interest in this important study and we value your, in, your feedback and participation. And please feel free to reach out to me um, in particular if you have any additional questions or concerns after this evening. Have a good night.